Costa Rican coffees, and I hope it's still in season. Everybody said it was when I ordered the coffees. Kevin, many of them have not arrived yet at the roaster. If anything, we're early. We're early. The high altitude Costa Ricas, which of course the coffee ripens later and makes it to the port later, we may get some uh, last year's crop to taste today. I hope we won't. From a consumer point of view, this is perfect because by the time they see this show, the best Costa Ricas should be available. Oh, that's great. And what month would that be? September through, uh, through the end of the year. And the harvest is in late spring, early summer, after the processing and transporting and buying and selling and all the other stuff. But there's a lot of, of shipment delays now all over the world. What's changed? I mean, I would think shipping would be better today than it was. Well, there are political and uh, social issues, particularly the Ethiopias were greatly delayed because the main port, which is not in Ethiopia, but Djibouti, is, uh, was under some kind of stress. I can't quite uh, remember the details, but uh, it had to do with uh, tensions in the region. And in other places in the world, I'm not really sure. It just it is, it seems, always seems to be delays. Is this COVID related? Maybe it's just the way shipping always has been, and people have been complaining about it for 40 years, and so it's still going on, and we don't remember last year's complaints. We only <laughs> hear these complaints. That's, okay, well, that sounds reasonable. I remember when I first started getting close to people in the coffee business, I was looking for perfect Kona once, and... A roaster told me, if I like Kona, you should really try a Costa Rican coffee. Is the growing region in Costa Rica anything like the growing region in Hawaii? No. The growing regions in Costa Rica that produce the coffees that we taste in the States are much higher elevation than in Kona. Also, they're isolated from the ocean. It's very different in terms of acidity and the complexity. You're kind of, in a very interesting way, entering the, uh, the Costa Rica description. One of the first people I met in the coffee business was Bill McAlpin, a grower in Costa Rica. I remember being introduced to him by Erna Knudsen. Erna told me that he was fabulous. She said, you'll really admire this guy. He's got machetes that he uses to you know, trim his weeds rather than use any poisons on them. That was the way she put it. In other words, she expressed him as someone who was all virtually obsessive about his coffee. I remember hearing about it, and then when I talked to him, everything verified it. She says, let me tell you, I think Costa Rica is an under-the-radar, one of the best coffees in the world. She said, what's great about it, it's got everything in balance. From there, I want to hear what you think of Costa Rican coffees. As, as is true all over the coffee world, there are two Costa Ricas, right? One Costa, well, maybe three, but let's not go there. Four. <laughs> uh, no, one is the legacy Costa Rica, the traditional Costa Rica, the Costa Rica that you're talking about, that Erna Knudsen talked about, that has been in all the books about coffee. A classic, balanced, high-grown coffee. And the Costa Rican coffee industry, very uh, well-organized, mature, and the producers are usually experienced and uh, they are not uh, starving or joining revolutions or anything like that. The Costa Rica coffee of legacy, the one that's in the books, the ones that Erna talks about, the ones you're remembering and that we may taste today, are classic in the sense that they're high grown. They're produced from tree varieties that are classic. In other words, they're not tree varieties with extraordinary character like Gesha or SL28 from Kenya. 
They're they're treat, but they're not robusta diluted varieties either. They're classic uh, coffees that we associate in America with uh, with a good cup, a classic cup. And the processing method has always been washed. In other words, very meticulously removing all of the fruit, soft fruit residue, drying the coffee in the parchment skin and shipping it. So all three of those factors, high growing elevation, a very uh, careful and consistent processing or fruit removal, and the variety, the classic variety, all of that adds up to a classic cup. When I wrote my first book on coffee, I compared coffees to various automobiles at the time, automobile brands, and I called, uh, I think, Costa Rica the Volvo of coffee. In other words, it's a very well-made, <laughs> classic, dependable, but not flashy, not a Porsche, which would have been, at the time, would have been a Kenya, maybe. That's the classic Costa Rica. Now, probably today, we're going to taste some of the new Costa Ricas, which are processed in different methods, more exotic, more conversation producing. In general, do you think there's new processes that would apply to every coffee growing region to get a variety of, of coffees? It depends. Uh, I mean, Panama is the epicenter, at least successful experimentation, honorably altering the uh, <laughs> the taste profile. And remember, Costa Rica is just northwest of Panama. Yeah, there, there's a lot of experiment in Costa Rica. The other countries, like we tasted Burundi, very little experimentation there. So the industry is still very traditional, I guess, and the, the, the people who run the mills are traditional and they have their customers who expect a certain kind of cup. Kenya, for example, the government outlaws any experiment. They're so <laughs> fixed on keeping the cup, which has always been one of the highest priced of Arabica coffees, traditionally. I mean, not because of competitions. I Kenya will command a higher price, and so the government wants, or the coffee authorities, I should say, like to keep it that way. Can't process a Kenya in a different way. That's the situation. In sure. Costa Rica, I think there's a lot of uh, loyalty to the traditional Costa Rican cup. About 2000, about the beginning of this uh, century, there was something in Costa Rica called the micro-mill revolution. <laughs> the micro-mill revolution were a lot of small, uh, younger, usually producers, who realized that they could experiment with processing method and produce a different kind of cup. Their um, particular innovation is honey coffee, removing just the skin and drying the coffee in the, uh, in the fruit mucilage, the fruit flesh, the sticky fruit flesh. They pioneered that. The Brazilians invented it, but the, really the Costa Ricans assigned the name Honey, which was successful, great, uh, great name, and popularized it. So as a country, it's a country that both was innovative, but in the same time is very loyal to the traditional cup. It sounds like it's uh, kind of between a highly experimental country and one that is like Kenya, where if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So if, if uh, with the Kenya, where there's the uh, famous black currant note that everybody looks for and the uh, at particular odd, sweet, tart twistiness of the acidity, those characteristics are, uh, are unique, right, in the world, really. The wet-hauled Sumatras, the so-called earthy Sumatras, yeah. are, are unique in the world of coffee, whereas the Costa Rica's strength wasn't, hasn't been uniqueness. It's been uh, solidity and consistency and uh, balance, above, uh, above all balance. A completeness. Balance often means you could have a cup that's balanced and there's not much to balance.
Mm-hmm. But I think with the Costa Rica, there's usually a solid aromatic uh, interest, not one that's uh, spectacular or striking or particularly noteworthy. It's just satisfying. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more shows like this.